All right. Um, let me um, introduce the speaker. Um, so Troy is um, a second year grad student um, doing his PhD at Texas A&M University. Um, he um, did his bachelor's in atmospheric sciences and a minor in physics at the University of Maryland. And he has worked on several uh, interesting uh, projects related to the atmospheric sciences and weather and climate modeling at uh, the National Center for Environmental Prediction and the Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, uh, he's gonna talk about his current project, which is um, using um, machine learning to uh, um, improve weather forecasting. And I'll um, let him take the screen from here. Thank you, JD, for that very nice introduction. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for allowing me to speak. This is a really exciting project that we've all been working on for the last two to one and a half years and very excited to present our um, results. Before I get started, I'd just like to thank some of our collaborators, um, Dr. Ishwan Soonyoung, Dr. Brian Hunt, Dr. Ed Ott, Alex Wickner, and JD Pathak, um, which I'm sure you all know, <laughs> um, for making some of this work possible. Um, today's topic is going to be a data-driven global weather prediction model using reservoir computing. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. So just a little introduction. Um, so as many of you all know, machine learning has a wide range of applications um, from image processing to playing complex human games such as Go to um, language processing. Um, machine learning has been um, applied to almost every field in the science community many um, times with great results. Um, so it's no surprise that previous work has shown success using machine learning um, to predict complex spatial temporal chaotic systems. One of the most important um, chaotic systems that affects every person's life daily, um, whether you're going to want to wear shorts or put a jacket on, all the way up to um, billions and trillions of dollars in terms of economic potential loss or economic potential growth is the weather. This naturally leads to the question, can a pure machine learning algorithm be able to predict something so complex and so um, high dimensional as the weather? So before I get into an actual pure machine learning weather prediction model, I wanna just talk about some machine learning applications that are being used today for numerical weather prediction or NWP. Numerical weather prediction is using um, numerical modeling to predict the weather um, X number of days into the future. Um, this is how your weather channel app or your favorite weather app gets its forecasts. There's many different operational weather forecast centers around the world, um, two of which I've had the pleasure of working at. And these operational centers are um, supported by some of the largest high performance computing um, systems in the entire world. The amount of data that's used and the amount of um, computational power is almost mm, mind blowing. Um, some of the top 10 computers of, in HPC are all used to um, operationally to predict the weather every few hours. So it's no surprise that with so much data and so much computational power that machine learning has really dug its roots into numerical weather prediction. Um, one of the most promising is the replacement of parameterization with trained neural networks. So parameterization is anything that a numerical model can't um, explicitly simulate. So for example, in a weather prediction model, mm -hmm. um, there's no way that you could account for all of the rain droplets in a cloud. And if you scale that up all the way to the globe, there's no way that you can keep track of every single rain droplet in the entire globe. So how they do it is they come up with some parameterization technique. Many of times these parameterization mm -hmm. techniques are the most computationally complex part of a numerical weather prediction model. So being able to train a neural network to emulate these parameterizations, um, once the training is done, is actually much more computationally efficient. There's been um, many resu um, encouraging results. And I believe one of the operational centers is actually replace some of their parameterization with a trained neural network. Another um, important machine learning application is post-processing. So once these numerical weather prediction models run and you have a forecast, there's inherent biases because of the complex 
um, terrain and topography in some locations. Um, models are unable to explicitly resolve mountains to the fullest extent. So being able to post-process and downscale these simulations and the forecast using machine learning has been um, extensively used almost for the last two decades. So those things are used operationally as well. And when we make forecasts for a day two prediction, we don't just run one simulation, we run an ensemble of predictive um, predictions. So being able to use machine learning to quantify uncertainty. So if you have 20 predictions of what the weather is going to be like tomorrow, you can use machine learning to highlight areas where the forecast is more uncertain. This is particularly important for those who are at the National Weather Service or other agencies that are human forecasters and need to express to the public what the weather is going to be like. If you know that there's going to be a tornado outbreak in five days and the models are very certain of this, then you can use more strongly worded language to inform the public. However, if the more uncertainty than usual for a day five prediction, then you'd also want to highlight that. And using these machine learning with ensembles offers another um, great benefit. Being able to non-linearly weight ensembles instead of the usual linear combination of X number of ensembles leads to much better forecasts. Um, when you linearly weight a number of ensembles, you get much more smooth and broad fields. You lose a lot of the finer scale detail. And being able to non-linearly weight different members for different situations leads to much better um, and more realistic forecasts. This is particularly useful for um, pre precipitation forecasts because when you weight a linear combination of the ensembles, you lose things like terrain and topography, which are quite important. So now that we've seen what the applications are. None of these applications really predict the weather. You still need a numerical model to predict what the weather is going to be like in four days. So we propose a criteria for what a global machine learning forecast model is. And there's, we came up with three criteria or three requirements. The first requirement is the easiest. Is it computationally feasible to train? So if we come up with a robust machine learning algorithm that we believe on paper could predict the global um, atmospheric state, is it going to be computationally feasible? These state-of-the-art numerical weather prediction models predict on the order of millions of variables at every time step. Because these are very high resolution simulations run usually at with grid spacing of 5 to 20 kilometers for the entire globe, we're talking about millions of grid points in the horizontal and then the vertical extent makes this even more complicated. Um, numerical weather prediction models start from the surface and they go all the way up to almost the mesosphere. So having a computationally feasible um, machine learning architecture is the first requirement. The second is if we determine that it is computationally feasible, is the machine learning algorithm going to be robust enough to predict three-dimensional atmospheric variables for the entire globe? Again, it's weather does happen at the surface and that's what affects us, but weather is just not a two-dimensional field. We need to be able to predict all, um, all the variables at each grid point in the three dimensions. And then there's other applications like what's the weather going to be like for an airplane? So we don't even care. Not only do we care about what the surface is, but we have to go all the way up into the stratosphere and in some applications even into the mesosphere. So having a machine learning algorithm that can be aware of these three-dimensional um, aspects to these fields instead of a two-dimensional makes the problem much more complex. And we're not going to only be predicting one variable, we're going to want to predict multiple variables. Temperature is probably one of the most important. When you're at the surface, you want to know if you're going to need a jacket or um, go into the, or is it safe to swim in the pool so it's not below freezing. So we definitely want to be able to predict temperature using machine learning. But other things such as wind um, is very important. So that's a vector. You're going to need to be able to predict the two components of wind. If you're interested in predicting whether there's going to be clouds or not tomorrow or if it's going to rain, you're going to also have to be able to predict moisture variables. And the list gets more extensive as your applications become more complex. In the state-of-the-art numerical weather prediction models, um, at each grid point and at each vertical level, the models predict almost 100 plus different variables, things ranging from total precipitation to temperature to the amount of 
cloud fraction. So state-of-the-art numerical weather prediction is quite complex. Um, and then finally, if we are able to one train the neural network and it is able to be able, it is able to predict three-dimensional variables, is it going to produce realistic atmospheric motions and phenomena? If it can predict one time step into the future, that's great, but that really limits the number of applications your machine learning algorithm has. Typical weather models run from one day all the way to two weeks. Two weeks is about the area where we reach practical predictability limit. So for um, weather that affects us from day to day, two weeks is about as far as we can predict. However, climate models are a completely different application. So if we wanted to use a machine learning climate model, we're gonna to have to be able to um, have realistic atmospheric motions and phenomena for not only a few weeks, but out to centuries. And the climate model situation becomes even more complex because you have things, you have very long-term variability on the scales of years, and you also have this um, increasing radiator forcing from global warming. So being able to um, predict something that's much more, doing something that would be a climate model application is much more robust than a weather prediction model. Some machine learning only weather models that have been out there. The first is Dubin and Beyer 2008. They used a convolutional neural network, a CNN, to, that was trained to predict just one two-dimensional atmospheric variable for the entire globe. The variable that they predicted is one of the, in terms of um, predictability, is the easy, was one of the easiest. But again, this was the first real attempt at being able to use machine learning to predict a atmospheric variable on the global scale. They used reanalysis data. So reanalysis data is our best attempt at a state of the atmosphere at in the past. We have uh, millions of observations for uh, um, windows of time in the atmosphere. However, they're not um, ho um, homogeneous in the X and Y space as well as in the vertical level. So the way reanalysis data is we take these observations feed them through a data simulation system and fill in the gaps using this data simulation system and our numerical model. So that is one thing is the machine learning algorithms that I'm going to be describing and ours are limited to um, using reanalysis data. So we still need a numerical model. So there's still limitations. And they use this reanalysis model and got encouraging results. This leads to share at all 2018 and 2019 B. They used, again, a convolutional neural network to predict full three-dimensional atmospheric variables. However, they found that the reanalysis data set, which only goes back to 1979, was not robust enough to um, train these neural networks. So, how, so they came up with a, an experiment where they used a simplified climate model to run for centuries. They used this um, centuries worth of data to train their um, convolutional neural network and we're able to predict the full three-dimensional atmospheric variables. However, upon applying this using transfer learning to the real atmosphere, they got mixed results. Um, many times the model, their model would blow up and, really, and predict very um, unrealistic things such as negative temperatures or pressure that was below the surface. So they were able to get three-dimensional atmospheric vectors predict, um, variables predicted, but they were limited to a simplified climate um, simulation, which finally leads us to the Wayne et al. 2019 and 2020 pa um, papers. Again, they, similar to their predecessors, they used a convolutional neural network to predict four two-dimensional um, atmospheric variables. They hand selected these four variables to be some of the most important to a meteorologist who wants to predict the weather, such as two meter temperature. So the temperature at two meters above the surface, which is quite important for everybody for day-to-day -day, um, decisions. They also predicted surface pressure and two other variables. And they found that they were able to use reanalysis data from 1979 to 2018 and predict realistic and stable results. However, they, again, they were still limited to using two-dimensional fields. So before I get into a little more of our um, model and talk about how we were able to achieve three-dimensional global predictions, I just want to go into a little um, detail about our machine learning algorithm. 
So we chose to use reservoir computing. Reservoir computing is one of the many different machine learning algorithms. Um, I should note that the reason we chose this is a bit arbitrary. The way our architecture is um, set up is it could be used for any um, machine learning algorithm, a convolutional neural network, or a different flavor of a recurrent neural network would suffice. But we found because reservoir computing is not deep learning, it's much more computationally efficient to train on the order of 10 to 100 times compared to that of a state-of-the-art recurrent neural network, such as, again, I mentioned a long short, a long short-term memory network or a gated recurrent unit. And they also, but more importantly, they found that a reservoir um, computing system gives similar performance to those state-of-the-art recurrent neural network architectures when applying this to a um, spatial temporal chaotic system, which is absolutely great because we're getting a much more um, a much easier system to train that gives us comparable results, and in some cases, even better results than state-of-the-art recurrent neural network architectures. And the way we implemented this reservoir computing system is there is memory in the system. So unlike the um, convolutional neural networks in the studies that I mentioned previous on the previous slide, this is going to incorporate memory. So this is just a quick summary of how we implemented reservoir computing for the, and this is the machine learning algorithm that I'm going to be referencing to for the rest of the talk. So we have an input signal, which is a spatial spatial temporal chaotic system, U of t. This is our training data at time t. And then we have this input layer or our Wn. This couples our input signal to our much higher dimensional reservoir. Again, because this is not deep learning, this is just a random fixed uniformly distributed matrix that just maps our U of t to our reservoir, which is much more high dimensional. And then we have our reservoir layer. Our implementation of this is a low degree directed random network of D um, nodes. So in the, if I mention in, later in the talk that we had 9,000 nodes, we, that means our reservoir was not had 9,000 nodes. And again, these are random fixed. And the way we represent this um, random network is using an adjacency matrix that um, with the weights of each, the, the weight of the, um, sparse adjacency matrix represents the degree of connectedness between each neuron and the strength of it. And because these are it's a sparse um, matrix, it makes us able to use the sparse linear algebra packages that are available to us and really speeds up the um, training time. And finally, we reach our W out layer or our output layer. This is where there's trainable parameters. This takes our reservoir um, nonlinear system and then maps it back into um, signal space. So we have a signal going in, the WN maps this to a much higher dimensional um, reservoir. There's nonlinear dynamics inside this reservoir. We use the activation function tan of H or a hyperbolic tangent, but you could use in theory any um, of the many different activation functions you have out there. And then we take this reservoir state and we now want to minimize this matrix W out so that we can make the reservoir system predict one time step into the future. I'll let that digest. <laughs> I know there's a lot on this one. Um, and feel free if you have any questions to ask me while um, I'm going through. I don't need, we don't have to wait until the end for any questions. Uh, can I ask a simple question? Sorry. Uh, can I ask a very, probably a very stupid question, but like very, I don't understand, so it may be helpful. No, no, if you no can stupid it. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, no, no, there's never a stupid so question. So I, I just don't understand, like, uh, what's the, like, the direct benefit of having a sort of, you know, like an end-to-end -end training in this part versus compared to breaking it down in three or four different smaller parts to train? So, like, it looks like it has lots of information, which could be maybe used in a more rigorous manner in stepwise training, for example. Okay, so um, the, the way we actually, so this is just one implementation. So the way we actually do this is, as I'm going to allude to in a second, is we actually break this um, U of T signal up into many different parts and make this very large, you know, U of T vector that could be on the order of hundreds of thousands of millions. And then we're going to break this up into 
much smaller sections using many different parallel reservoirs. So we actually end up getting um, very good results with a small node, a small number of nodes compared to a much more robust system such as like a auto encoder or auto encoder types convolutional neural network. Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you yeah. mentioned the size is so large, it would make yeah. sense to bring it down to a smaller resolution before you yeah. put any kind of computation. Yes, yes. So yes, the when when we presented this problem, the and as the previous um, people have looked at, the idea is using a convolutional neural network with like some auto encoder or something with down sampling and then up sampling type system. There's many different things like um, UNet that's out there, and that's what they've actually used most of them. Mm -hmm. However, the, the way we differ is we're going to actually break this U of T up into many small parts using the principle of locality. So that's two slides away. So I'm going to get to there in one second. Okay, okay, great, great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Oh, no problem. Thank you for that good question. Oh, now I can't move my slides. Oh, there we go. So just to get a little more understanding of why I said that this machine learning algorithm of using a reservoir computing in this system is kind of arbitrary. So we have a training and predict two phases, a training and prediction phase. So we have a signal U of T of U N of T coming into our black box machine learning. We've trained it to be able to predict one time step into the future. However, one time step into the future for weather applications is really kind of useless. I can probably, you know, with my brain, be able to tell you what the weather's going to be in an hour. Um, most meteorology um, students could probably do that, but no human has the, you know, capacity to tell you what the entire globe is going to look like five days from now. So being able to predict one time step in the future unfortunately is really limits the application to your machine learning algorithm. And the part where we used a recurrent neural network instead of a convolutional neural network, which won't have memory is because we're gonna end up feeding this signal um, once the machine learning's trained back in. So we make, so we train our machine learning. We have a, the last observation, which is U of N of T. We put it through the machine learning algorithm and now we have one prediction into the future, one time step into the future. And because this thing has memory and it's already trained to predict another time step, we take this one time step into the future prediction and feed it back into the machine learning algorithm. The machine learning algorithm does its nonlinear transformations and stuff, and you get a prediction of two time steps into the future. And you can use this iterative process now to predict arbitrarily as far into the future as you want. Doesn't necessarily mean that your predictions are going to be great if you feed this through a million times. But if everything worked well and your machine learning algorithm learned the dynamics of your complex system, you're able to um, understand, you're able to capture the climate of this um, complex system, even if you aren't able to have any predictive skill. So that's the really great part about this is the machine learning, um, our machine learning network, the reservoir computers are gonna have some sort of memory in this. It's going to be able to take that signal from two times ago and remember that there's some correlation in terms of time with these variables in the atmospheric um, atmospheric field and be able to use that to correctly make another time step into the future. So now we have a machine learning algorithm that can predict as far into the future as you want. However, as this was alluded to with that question before, is our U of T in this case is massive. Um, even at very low resolution, horizontal resolution and low vertical resolution, the atmosphere and the globe itself is, as you can imagine, massive. We're going to have to be predicting more than one variable, as I mentioned. We're going to have to predict at least one height level but because we want to do, because of the requirements that we made that we want to do three-dimensional fields, we're going to have to predict multiple vertical levels. So the way we achieve this because it wouldn't be computationally feasible to have millions of inputs with mil to predict millions of outputs at every time step is we break the domain into many small subregions. So that the key principle here is the parallel machine learning architecture. Um, and because of the principle of locality, so the weather in Taiwan is not gonna be affecting the weather in New York City on the scale of an hour. Eventually there will be effects. If we made our time step too large, say we made a time step of 10 days or something because we wanted to do cl climate simulations, the weather in Taiwan is definitely going to be needed to be known for the prediction over New York City. 
But if we make the time step small enough, then the information only has to pass through a very small subregion of our entire domain. So we chose an hour time step, which is the highest temporal resolution that the um, reanalysis data sets are sampled in. And we broke the globe up into a 1,152 sections. And when you plot this into a Mercator projection, we see that each blue line here represents the area that a machine learning algorithm has to predict. So each time, so if we go back, each one of those blue boxes here represents one independent blue box on this figure. So we have many, many reservoirs that are being trained to predict a small geographical region. They can be trained independently, which is key. So this is where the high performance um, computation comes in. We can train each one of these blue boxes on a different GPU or a different CPU. Um, and because these um, weather systems, um, the high performance clusters where the large numerical weather prediction models are run have hundreds of thousands of CPUs, we can really scale this up, um, which is great. So we break the domain into these small little boxes. And so each reservoir only has to predict a much smaller subset of the data. In this case, at each reservoir has to predict one, four grid points, so a two by two box. However, if the reservoirs are completely independent, there's no way to resolve features larger than a two by two box. So in this case, we would be able to resolve one wave, kind of, you really need more than two grid points to resolve a wave. Um, so we would never be able to resolve a wave. The way we get around this is we take information from the surrounding um, neighbors. So in this case, this red box represents the information that's put into the reservoir. So we put more information into the reservoir than what needed than what's predicted from the reservoirs. So in this case, we're taking information from the neighboring eight um, regions to be able to predict a subregion here. So this four by four box has a lot of information coming in. And then we use that information to predict only a two by two box. And if you can imagine if obviously the plot would get a little too messy forever for anybody to ever understand, but we can scale this whole thing up and we end up having a bunch of different overlapping regions, but the prediction ends up being just a, the globe itself. So there's more information getting put into each reservoir than what needs to be predicted. This allows for information to pass seamlessly from region to region. We're able to resolve waves that are much larger than a two by two, than this small geographical region represented by this two by two box. We can represent waves on the scale of the entire globe with this architecture, as long as we choose a correct time step. Because if we choose the time step that was too long, then we would start, then we wouldn't be able to resolve features because if we needed information from here to resolve the feature in one hour, then we wouldn't be able to get that in this scenario. So we, so for training, so we now have a parallel machine learning architecture that in theory is able to predict an entire globe, but we can be trained in parallel. So we can, it's massively parallel. So as long as computational hours and memory is not an issue, in theory, we can predict the globe now. So how we get the training data is we take the ERA-5 reanalysis data set. This is the most sophisticated um, reanalysis data set available. It really only just came out within the last two years. The temporal um, evolution of that data set is on, hours, on an hourly time scale. So really this architecture wouldn't have been possible without this data set because with a three hour time step, we're really starting to, you're gonna start losing fast um, features in the atmosphere. So this is really key is having a higher resolution, a higher temporal resolution data set. And this part's a little um, confusing if you don't have the end goal in mind, but we end up regridding this um, reanalysis data set to a climate model horizontal and vertical um, grid. The reason we re, um, grid this to a climate model is because we want to um, be able to compare our um, numerical or machine learning model to a numerical model. But there's also another reason. The end goal is to take your climate model and your trained machine learning network and be able to leverage those two, that in, two information in a hybrid type system correctly, thus improving upon your machine learning network and your um, numerical network or your numerical model, which I'll talk a little bit at the end of this if I have time. We chose 
to use five prognostic variables. So at each grid point in this figure, oh, sorry, can't go backward. Oh, okay, in each one of these grid points, there is five um, variables that need to be predicted and there's eight vertical layers. So if we imagine, if you could somehow extend this plot into the three dimensions, we're gonna have eight of these grid points lining on top of each other as you go up in the atmosphere. Each, at each grid point, you're gonna have to predict five prognostic variables. Your two components of the wind, which is called U and V, U is your east-west direction of your wind, your zonal wind, and your V component of your wind is your north-south direction of your wind. And those are one of the most important types of variables. The next one is your temperature. Again, if we wanna know if we need shorts or a jacket today, we're gonna to wanna to know temperature. And then our last three-dimensional variable is specific humidity. So this is our moisture variable. Um, there's many different variables of choice for moisture, specific humidities, probably the most popular in numerical weather prediction um, because it encompasses a lot of information and the way you formulate your equations that you solve or make it more simple with specific humidity. But there are other ones out there. So we have four three-dimensional variables and now we have a special variable which I call surface pressure. So this is the pressure defined as the interface between the land and the atmosphere. So this is a terrain following two-dimensional variable this is quite an important variable for our machine learning architecture because without surface pressure, the machine learning would have no idea about um, orography. So we're not input. So one of the inputs that we're not putting in is terrain height or orography. So the surface pressure is a proxy for the orography. But a surface pressure has a many other different applications. It's the entire weight of the atmosphere, so it really encompasses a lot of information. It's what you see on weather maps with the nice red low pressure systems and the blue high pressure systems. It tells you when your weatherman's telling you, oh, the low pressure system's moving off the coast of, onto the coast, you probably want to get your rain jacket and stuff. So surface pressure is probably one of the most important meteorological variables. But it is a little different than the other variables I mentioned because it's two dimension and it's terrain following. And we, requ we acquired the 20 years of this data spanning from 1981 to 2000. Um, we partitioned this data such that 19 years was for training and one year was for validating our predictions. Um, we really didn't do too much um, hyperparameter tuning. Um, with something as large as this, um, each geographical region is going to need slightly different hyperparameters and stuff. So we really just did some hand tuning, but there, as far as we were aware, there was no systematic way of training this using like numerics. Uh, or using a computational software. So most of the tuning was done by hand and we didn't need to partition the data into a, you know, another year worth of validation and um, verification. So all of that's done in that one year. So we did a, so we trained the neural network, our parallel neural network. We inputted 19 years of data and we now wanna make a prediction. So what I'm gonna show here is a movie. So this is a simulated forecast starting on January 27th, 2000 at 8 um, universe, at 8 a.m. universal time. What's plotted here in the colored contours are temperature at the near surface. So this is the temperature, this is the closest temperature to the surface that we have in this model. And the vectors that are plotted here are wind vectors, again, at the, closest level to the surface. So this would be the variable that you would most likely be able to feel. You would feel that you'd be, this is close to sensible temperature and sensible wind, what you can feel. And the direction of the vector, of the wind vector is the direction of the wind and the magnitude of the wind vector is the size of the arrow. So this is the first hour prediction after we trained our neural network. We see that the you know, machine learning algorithm is able to, for at least one hour, produce realistic results. We see that it's warmer in the equatorial regions and colder in the poles, as you would expect. There's large scale phenomena, much larger. So each one of these wind vectors represents a grid point. So if you remember two figures ago, each machine learning algorithm is only able to predict four of these, but we see features that are much larger resolved. We see a large low pressure system that's spinning in the correct direction in the Southern hemisphere. 
somewhere in the Southern Pacific. That's, much lar that's a much larger feature than a two by two box. We see the trade winds over the equatorial region, and we see a very large low pressure system over Alaska. So at least for one hour, the machine learning algorithm is able to work. But let's see if our third criteria, being able to produce realistic weather phenomena for at least two weeks is correct. So as I play this, there's gonna be a couple of things. So we're gonna see things like the diurnal cycle. So as the sun comes up and the sun comes down, there's gonna be changes in temperature. Um, so we would want, expect that when the sun is up, we'd hope that there's warmer temperatures. And when the sun is going down, the temperature is cool. We see that the reservoir without being explicitly told what time of day it is, but it, because it has memory, is able to know where in the calendar, where in the 24-hour um, cycle it is. So it's able to, even after 30 or 40 iterations, up to 100 iterations, it's still able to know what time of day it is for that region. We also see some large systems over the um, in between Russia and Alaska, coming off the coast of Japan. So this is where the movie ends. So this is 15 days after the um, simulation starts. Again, still warmer in the equatorial region, colder in the um, polar regions. We see low pressure systems. So we are at least able to get realistic for um, simulated forecasts out to day 15. And if we can even extend this to day 20. So we're able to have stable, realistic weather phenomena out to day 20 at least. After day 20, we start running into some problems with the way we implemented our parallel architecture, but we're quite confident that we're going to be able to continue these simulations um, even further than 20, so for our climate application. Um, for this 15-day forecast, there's just a couple of more interesting phenomena that I'd love, like to point out. So, this is the this is February of 2000. So this is the winter in the northern hemisphere. Um, during the winter, there is um, quite a number of storms that form off the Gulf of or off the uh, shore of Japan and move towards the polar region. End up and usually end up somewhere near Alaska. This is because there is a large sea surface temperature gradient um, corresponding with the Kuroshima current right off the Gulf of Alaska, uh, sorry, not the Gulf of Alaska, right off the um, Japan coast. Without being explicitly told the machine learning, because there's no S, um, sea surface temperatures being inputted, the machine learning algorithm is able to understand that there's supposed to be, during this time of year, storms here. And we see that it does develop quite a large system at apparently day 15. We see a couple of other features that quickly catch the eye of a meteorologist. So we see that the machine learning um, algorithm is not only able to resolve features that would be present in the field, but it also understands the correlation between each variable. So the wind is usually a really important variable if you want to know what the temperature is going to be, because it's warmer in the equator and the gradient goes, and we have a temperature gradient going towards the poles where it's colder. When you have southerly winds, you expect there to be warmer temperatures associated with this. So we see with this very large um, low pressure system off the coast of Alaska, we have warm air getting evicted north towards the poles by the southerly winds. We see what looks like a cold front um, situated here where there's this change in um, wind direction. So now you have um, air coming from the poles moving down and we see colder temperatures. Again, none of this was explicitly told in the reservoir. The reservoir, after 20 years or 19 years of training, was able to understand these relationships. And it's quite important, though, that you know these features are much larger than the individual reservoir, which means this principle of locality is really working. Um, I don't believe that if you had something that didn't have memory in a machine learning algorithm, such as a plain convolutional neural network, you'd be able to understand these different scales in terms in these different temporal scales that are happening because there's very high frequency and very low frequency um, oscillations going on in the atmosphere during this simulation. The high frequency diurnal cycle where the temperatures are going up and down every few hours, but we also have these waves that are generating these cyclones that are on the order of days. So the machine learning is able to understand the different temporal evolutions of these um, waves and other type of oscillations in the atmosphere and correctly um, make those predictions. Oh, sorry, uh, let's see how I move this. Okay, it's all great that we can make realistic simulations, but are the forecasts, forecasts accurate? 
So for order for there to be forecast scale, we have to beat a number of different metrics that um, we've defined in numerical weather prediction. The easiest metric to beat is called persistence. So this means that the state of the atmosphere at time t when you start your prediction is going to be the state of the atmosphere for the entire length of the prediction. So that means it's just assuming that the atmosphere is static. Um, if you can't be persistent, that means whatever your um, model is doing is doing worse than nothing. So you really don't want to be doing worse than persistent. The other um, important benchmark for predictability is are you beating climatology? Climatology actually is in the long term always the winner. No matter how good your numerical model is, if you let your simulations run long enough, then you're never going to be able to beat climatology. Climatology is defined as a 30 year average um, of the atmospheric variable that you want to predict at that time. So in this case, if we go back to the previous movie, we start at January 27th, 2000 at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so if we wanted to figure out what the skill of temperature is and we start a prediction at that time, we need to know what the previous 30 years or more um, was at that time. We do some averaging with climatology to remove things like the diurnal cycle, um, but basically the climatology and persistence are the two um, forecast metrics that you need to beat. So I'm going to just show some global root mean squared error plots for temperature at day one, day two, and day three. The red curve is persistence, so that's the state of the atmosphere is going to be the same throughout this entire length of the forecast. Then we have blue, which is our machine learning algorithm that's um, fully trained on 19 years of data. Then we have green. This is called speedy. This is a climate model, so this is our numerical model that we want to see if we can beat. And then finally, black is climatology. And we see that for the day one forecast for um, temperature, we have root mean squared error as a function on the X and we have pressure at the Y. So at each pressure level of the model, we're gonna average our root mean squared error and we plot that as a vertical line. So these are vertical profiles of um, root mean squared error. We see that almost everywhere in the vertical profile, our machine learning is doing on par or better than our numerical model. And again, we use the same initial conditions for our numerical model on the same grid. So it is a completely fair comparison to that. Um, the biggest separation between our numerical model and our machine learning algorithm is in the stratosphere. So anywhere from 100 hect hectopascals up to 25 hectopascals is what I define as the stratosphere. The stratosphere has quite complex dynamics that require you getting the troposphere, which is the lowest level of the atmosphere, um, forecast correct. So if we're not going to be, if your numerical model is not able to understand the relationship between the um, stratosphere and the troposphere, you're going to get bad results. And speedy, because the interactions are quite complex and are very driven by convection, speedy, our numerical model actually does very badly for temperature in the stratosphere. Our numeric, our machine learning model though, seems to have no problem we don't see any real large inflection like we do here with our error curve. It's basically straight from the upper troposphere into the stratosphere. This means that the machine learning algorithm is able to understand these relationships in the um, vertical direction. It's understanding that there's, there's convection, the stratosphere is going to warm, there's things like tropospheric folding and stuff that, drive, that really drives these temperatures at this scale. By day two, again, it's a very similar story, we, which is 48 hours. We are still beating persistence. We're definitely still beating climatology or red and black curves. Um, our numerical model, again, is still struggling to, is now not only doing worse than persistence, but it's doing worse than climatology or on par in cl with climatology um, in the stratosphere, especially at the highest level. Um, our, the numerical model was never designed to be a stratospheric model, but in order to get these relationships um, between the stratosphere and troposphere, it does need to um, forecast those because without a stratospheric forecast your troposphere and your weather at the surface is eventually going to fail so it's good to it's important that we have um, forecast of these atmospheric fields all the way up to 25 millibars or 25 hectopascal but the machine learning and the numerical model are basically doing on par there's a few areas where the numerical model really struggles such as 200 hectopascal, where the machine learning is still doing quite well. And then there's areas where our machine learning algorithm is struggling 
and numerical model does well, but basically they're doing about on par when you average this over the global, um, the whole globe. And then finally, we get to a day three forecast. This is where we start seeing the um, machine learning models start to rapidly increase in terms of error. Um, in the lower troposphere from 400 hectopascal to 1000 hectopascal, um, the machine learning algorithm is doing much worse than that of the numerical model. We are not going to be beating climatology for too much longer, but we're still being able to have skill um, both compared to the climatology and persistence in the stratosphere with this variable. Um, oh, I think I somehow moved back, but that's just one variable. Again, we had five variables to predict. One of the most important variables for um, wave dynamics in the atmosphere is the V component of the wind. So this is your north-south direction of your wind. Um, this is one of the most important atmospheric variables if you want to get things such as Rossby waves, um, correct. And this is really where the numerical model is going to excel. Um, this is probably the most difficult. Um, there's, it's hard to quantify difficulty in terms of prediction, but I would say this is the most difficult for the machine learning. Um, this involves things like um, barotropic and baroclinic instabilities um, to generate Rossby waves. There's a dispersion with group and phase velocities in this variable, so it's quite complex. Um, and it's a little different than temperature where there's really just you're vecting or moving around temperature. Um, here there's sources and sinks, you know, there's troughs that come into existence out of nowhere and then these troughs decay and there's multiple wave numbers on top of each other. So it's kind of like a wave packet. So this is quite more, this is a quite more complex um, variable. And we see that, you know, the machine learning algorithm for the first day does on par, but quickly starts losing skill by day three. And lastly, we have our moisture variable. This is where the numerical model struggles the most. This is heavily parameterized and by the numerical model. So a lot of these are subgrid sub -grid processes, such as the sources and sinks for this term. Um, those are all done on much smaller scales than the model has. But we see the machine learning actually understands these sources and sinks um, for the, and can really excel with this. This is probably where the machine learning excels the most. Um, it's beating the numerical model, persistence and climatology for a day one and day two forecast. We start losing some skill by day three, but we're still even doing better at the surface than climatology and doing much better than our numerical model, which is over here. So the machine learning algorithm in every sense of the word has skill at least out to day three. Um, however, there's still some limitations to our machine learning only algorithm. There's no cross polar flow. Um, so information can't pass across the flow, um, across the singularities at the poles. The cross function used to train doesn't contain any physical constraints, such as global conservation of energy and conservation of tracers, such as um, moisture. So moisture can be treated as a tracer. There's going to be sources and there's going to be sinks, but they should at, in the end even out and there should be almost a constant amount of um, moisture in the atmosphere. The one of the most Important things though is the horizontal resolution for this that I showed is considerably lower than that of a state-of-the-art numerical weather prediction models on the order of at least a magnitude. So the resolutions that we were resolving here are on the scale of th uh, 300 kilometers. The state-of-the-art global um, numerical weather prediction models are on the order of five to 15 miles. And then lastly though, the climate of our model actually, once we go out to day 20, is just too high. There's too much variability in the long wave dynamics of the atmosphere. So wave numbers around the, um, if you imagine the, around a um, longitudinal band, wave numbers one through three really don't vary on the time scales of one to two days. They really vary on the scales of seven to 10 to 15 days. But our machine learning algorithm puts too much variability in these long wave dynamics which ends up causing us to saturate at a much higher, our errors to saturate at a considerably higher level than that of where you'd expect. In a perfect model, we would expect that our blue or machine learning algorithm saturates at the red curve and then our, see our numerical model, which is um, very finely tuned to saturate at climatology or saturate at persistence forecast, hasn't even reached that level. So, our, so in that respect, our numerical model or our machine learning model actually fails. But there is a next step, and I'm going to go through this very quickly because I think I'm running out of time here. Um, 
we want to incorporate the, our machine learning algorithm into something we call a hybrid weather prediction model. So previous work has shown success in co combining a numerical model algorithm with a machine learning algorithm for spatial temporal chaotic systems. It's, this hybrid type system improved forecast skill compared to that of a numerical model and a machine learning only predictions. So it's our eventual goal to develop a system that leverages both a general circulation model, which I showed earlier, or a climate model, which is speedy, and our machine learning algorithm, which I've been showing for our entire talk. And we're going to improve the, um, both of these predictions by training the machine learning algorithm to correct, correctly leverage our climate model, our GCM, and be able to make predictions by training on reanalysis data set. This is the, we're gonna be using the hybrid technique um, used by Pathak et al, 2018b, um, basically the exact same idea. Um, I won't go too much into our parallel hybrid architecture, but basically we take our knowledge-based model, which is denoted by M, and we put our signal through that knowledge-based model, and we put the signal of the, our, um, your U of T into our reservoirs. So we then have a hybrid type system that's able to make prediction. Um, the hybrid, the numerical model that we use in our hybrid is speedy, which again, I won't go into too much detail for lack of time, but speedy stands for a simplified parameterization, primitive equation dynamics model. Um, it is a climate model, so it's not really ever used for weather prediction, but we're going to test our hybrid system by taking something that wasn't ever designed to make short-term predictions and mix it with a, or make it a hybrid type system with our machine learning algorithm, which is a forecast model and see if we can correctly leverage that, those two information, those two systems with information to create a better forecast. And I'm just gonna show some very preliminary results for this and then draw some conclusions. So um, again, we have, this is a time series of the global root mean squared error for near surface temperature. We have our purple curve, which is our parallel or machine learning only model. This, this is what I've been talking about for the entire talk. We have speedy, our numerical model, which I've been talking about for our talk. And then we have persistence, which again is defined as the forecast at time. The start of the forecast is going to be the state of the atmosphere at any time during the forecast. And we see that for very short term forecasts, the hybrid system is actually able to be not only the numerical model, but our machine learning only algorithm too for the first nine hours of our forecast. This is averaged over 20 runs over which span the entire year. So we are getting a good um, se seasonalities incorporated in this and stuff. So we see that the hybrid for the short term is able to predict better than our machine learning or our numerical model. To, um, and when we combine those two in our hybrid system, we get a better forecast. The really big problem though is the stability of our hybrid system. As we see the error curves really quickly steepen much higher than that of the numerical model speedy and our machine learning only, which is the purple. So there's obviously um, these nonlinear feedbacks that are occurring between our climate model and our machine learning only, which we are trying to fix. And with a minute or two left, I believe, um, I'm just gonna draw some conclusions. So a parallel machine learning architecture is scalable. It can be done offline as in if you, um, usually when we turn, refer to off and online, we're saying offline is done before we have to make a prediction. So as long as we can train this before we have to make a prediction, it can sit there. And as soon as we want to make, make a prediction, we turn this to online and it makes a much quicker forecast. And it can be synchronized to make predictions at any time after being trained. Um, a data-driven only global weather forecast model can produce stable and realistic results with predictive skill at out to at least three days. And finally, a hybrid system so similar to Pathak et al. 2018b can successfully be applied to a numerical weather prediction model, at least in the very short term. This is very preliminary. Um, we haven't really done any tuning with this, trying to understand how the machine learning and the uh, model interacts with our numerical model is quite difficult. So being able to fix these stability issues is um, something that must be needed before um, we completely sign off that a hybrid system is um, successful. But with that, I'm going to take any questions.